Do you have a computer? How many do you have? They are everywhere, including down at the courthouse, and you'll be amazed at how they're using them there. We'll talk about finding courthouse documents right now on The Law Works. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Closed captioning for The Law Works is made possible by a grant from the Monongalia County Bar Association to support legal information and education for all West Virginians. The Law Works is made possible by a major grant from the West Virginia Bar Foundation, the philanthropic organization for West Virginia's legal profession and legal system, promoting public knowledge of the law in West Virginia. By the generous support of Software Systems Incorporated, a West Virginia company established in 1975 providing high-end support services, programming, and consulting for county government AS400 mid-range computer systems as well as PC-based systems. And by viewers like you. Thousands of files and books weighing hundreds of tons and occupying hundreds of thousands of square feet of space are being made obsolete. My guests are Barbara Kaur, Clerk of the Circuit Court of Marion County, and Michael Manley, President and CEO of Software Systems Incorporated. And Mike, before we start, we ought to point out that you're one of the, you, your company is one of the underwriters of yes. this program. And Barb, I suppose we should point out that you're the Circuit Clerk of uh, Marion County. If I do business with Marion County Circuit Court, I bring all my business to you too. That's correct. <laughs> talk, talk, Barb, about what being a circuit clerk is. You have big responsibility with regard to records and documents. One of our main functions is that we are the official keeper of the records for circuit courts. Um, we have to be accountable for every piece of paper that is filed in any circuit court in the state of West Virginia. So. Um, you're talking about dealing with millions of pieces of paper a year, and you have to have some place to put those those pieces of paper. Now we have 55 county courthouse. Yes. So the load is distributed, I guess, over 55 courthouses, but still each one has thousands and thousands of documents. Yes. You may have on in, in a case file, perhaps one case file might have 15 or 20 pages in that particular case file. But then in some counties, they are handling mass litigation suits, which there are thousands and thousands of pieces of paper in one case file. Well, I, I know that even in the simplest of business disputes, uh, lawyers measure things in terms of banker boxes full of documents. And you can have three, four, five, six <clears throat> banker boxes full of documents. And in, in really serious criminal cases, murder cases, things like that, you can have many, many, many boxes of documents. And you all are working in buildings that are sometimes 150 years old. Correct. Um, even though in Marion County we are um, scanning every document that comes into the office, we're still required by West Virginia Code to physically have the physical documents, the physical case files. So once we scan the documents into the system, we still have to put those documents into a case file. Um, right now, we can only house approximately 10 years, eight to 10 years of case files in our courthouse. So that means, and this is, this is just the way it is in every county in, in West Virginia, you have to store the rest of your records in an off-site facility. Well, and you're not the only clerk in the county. Correct. You have county clerk's offices. We have to, um, you know, they have to maintain their records, store those records. You have assessors. You have sheriffs. You have prosecuting attorneys. You have to have some place to store these records. County clerk's offices, uh, we're, we're talking about now the difference between circuit clerk and county clerk. Circuit clerk, clerk works with the trial court. The county clerk's office works with the county commission. They used to be called county courts, which is why they have clerks. 
they keep copies of every deed, every, we'll call them mortgages, they're technically deeds of trust, and dozens and dozens of other documents about the way we own property, the way we live our lives, the way we die, the way we handle our estates. And between the circuit and the county clerk's offices, there are tons, tons. of material typically bound up in big books that take young people two hands to lift. That's correct. And as we get older, sometimes we recruit others to help us. And then there's the sheriff office who keeps track of uh, have you, whether you have paid your taxes, uh, the assessor's office, how much you're supposed to pay in those taxes. It's just overwhelming. It is. In fact, we kind of joke most older courthouses have dungeons in the basement where these records are moved and they're stored on shelf units that are very close together and you have to get almost, you don't literally wear a miner's hat, but it wouldn't be a bad idea if you did. In some courthouses, it wouldn't be a bad idea. So all of these records are, what happens if the courthouse burns down? Those records, in, in, in our case, we have, like I said, eight to ten years of the original case files in our office. Should something happen to the courthouse, those files would simply be destroyed physically. The physical files would be destroyed. And that does happen from time to time. Sure. Remember the incident up in Morgan County where the courthouse uh, burned to the ground? And that was just in the last few years that the Morgan in County the last Courthouse five burned. Years, yes. Last five years, yeah. and every county is replete with stories of that. When you go down to the courthouse, you, you will say, "My great 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 grandfather owned land in the western part of the county or the southern part of the county. I'd like to see the deed for that." And, and you'll be asked, "Well, when was that?" And if you give an answer that is before about 1880 the chances are really good you had a fire in your courthouse and those records were destroyed. It, it, it is, in a very real sense, a tragedy, although I guess we have survived. Well, Mike, what, are you, what does your company do about problems like this? Well, one of, the, uh, one of the things we've tried to do along the way is to automate the process so that as these documents are brought into the courthouse, they're then scanned in, stored on optical storage, and can be, the image of those documents can be retrieved at, at any time. Uh, along with that, copies of those documents are stored off-site. Uh, for example, in Barb's case, um, her documents are stored on optical storage and those optical platters are periodically copied and taken off-site and put in a safe deposit box at a bank down the road. Ah, uh, yes, but there is another problem with that. How far down the road do you go? Uh, about 10 or 15 years ago, there was a terrific flood in Grand Forks, North Dakota, where the entire town was flooded, law offices were destroyed, the courthouse was destroyed, the records in the courthouse was, were destroyed, and many banks and other facilities also were seriously damaged and their vaults were damaged too. So some of these things were lost. When the levees broke in New Orleans, New Orleans was effectively destroyed or put out of operation. So the old concept of, well, we have the county courthouse and we have the annex across the street, that's not enough. You can't put them, where, so where do you store these things? Well, right now, like I say, I've, we store a copy of ours off-site, but I've asked uh, software systems, and Mike's currently working on it, to where you can, and I'm sure you've seen it even like in your home, PC, where you can um, have this, these, these documents stored online. They're stored online. They, they talk about what? Putting it in the cloud now. Yes. Well, we're, we're dealing with um, the state network right now and working out a process where Barb's information will be copied on a nightly basis to uh, a site here in Morgantown. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, not within the blast radius, I guess, of a nuclear bomb, but it certainly is, uh, is far enough away from Fairmont that her records are probably going to be extremely safe. That's also a facility that deals in um, protection of data. I mean, that's their primary task is to uh, maintain the integrity. They keep some of WVU's records. They keep records from the school systems. They keep records from all over the state in there. And so they have a facility that is designed just for that purpose. A lot of courthouses, um, in Barb's case, they have a computer room, but a lot of courthouses have their computers stored in a closet someplace or uh, someplace that, that's just really not very secure when it comes to, to this this kind of concept of this data being important. Um, but at least in her case, they do have a, a specialized computer room with locked doors and all that sort of thing. 
So a uh, combination of, uh, that's, that's really the best answer, is a combination of types of backup of the data so that this data is in more than one place at the same time. The old joke in the computer industry is uh, how do you protect your data and, and the response is back up. And then the next step is to back up your right. data. And then you should probably back up your data and then when you're done with all of that, back it up again. In, in fact, in my office, we run a system that runs five or six computers, and we back up the documentary data to each computer, then to two external hard drives, and then to two flash drives, which are really wonderful devices. And I put one of those in my pocket when I leave at night to make sure that it is off-site, at least with me. I do not mail them to New Mexico to secure them, but I probably should. Well, one of the other things that's, uh, that's rather unique about the way Barb's system operates is it is an optical disk. So that optical disk could melt down in a fire, but if we're talking about a flood or some other kind of damage, it's a, it's a laser etched image into that optical disk, and it's, it's got a 100-year shelf life, which is another thing that, uh, that you probably need to consider when you're talking about record storage is the shelf life. Um, magnetic media has a limited shelf life, and uh, obviously the paper copies have a limited shelf life these other kinds of, of storage formats give you that protection for a lot longer period of time. We're talking about document imaging. My guests are Barbara Core, Clerk of the Circuit Court of Marion County, and Michael Manley, President and CEO of Software Systems Incorporated. I'm Dan Ringer, and this is The Law Works. I have a very good friend who uh, teaches computer science and electrical engineering at West Virginia University. When he comes into my office, he's always asking me a question about my backups, and the last time he came in, he says, how often do you overwrite those disks? How often do you replace those disks? And now I'm given to understand that I can't just rely on these things working forever. That's uh, right. We know that uh, hard drives, for example, are going to crash at some point in the future. So now he's got me thinking I not only have to back up, I have to replace the thing I'm backing up to every now and again. And yes. it's, when I guess, want to get rid of them, I have to smash it, jump up and down on it, burn it, and then feed it through the shredder. Yeah, in the, in the case of the, of the circuit clerk's records, these are on write once media. In other words, once they've been written, they cannot be changed. This is one of the requirements that the Supreme Court put on um, maintaining these images or copies of the information is that it cannot be altered once it's written. So it's a little different situation than, than what you're talking about where you make a copy and then you, you reuse that same media. This media is used one time and it's a permanent copy. So uh, no, nobody can come in and alter that document unless they physically destroy the disk. It, it is a, an official copy at that point. Barb, this sounds like a really expensive undertaking. You've got to be spending lots more money. We are. And I will tell you that, that Marion County um, has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars um, on this particular system. But what you have to look at is we are attempting, we are putting a stop to um, the creation of, of more records. Once we get them imaged um, and they're backed up accordingly and they come into compliance with what we call the records retention schedule, you can destroy, there's timelines that you can destroy certain records. We have been very proactive in the last two years and we have destroyed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of records, and that's what we'll continue to do until it just comes to a halt. Well, and as our laws and rules catch up with what you're doing, you won't have to keep these large physical records anymore, most likely. You're exactly right. What we need to do and what we're addressing currently with the, the Supreme Court is we have a uh, records retention committee that will be reactivated. When those record retention rules were written. They were written long before all of this technology came about, so obviously they need to be revamped, and we're going to do that. It, I, I see that in the future, that eventually, um, as you know, in federal courts, they have paperless filings, and I, I truly think that will eventually happen in circuit courts as well. When you talk about the cost, um, it, it sounds like a lot of money, but you're stopping, uh, let's say you might have to buy a building every three or four years to store these records in. 
you're just you're you're stopping the the more creating creating more of this paperwork, and uh, it really does pay off. It pays off in the end. For instance, now if you called me and said, um, gave me a case file number and looked it up and said, Barb, I'd like to have those five those five pages, instead of even copying those on a copier and sending them to your faxing. I can say, give me your email, and I can now email you those documents. You've cut down on the use of a copier, the paper, the fax machine, and the paper in a fax machine. Let me have your uh, computer there. You brought with you my iPad. Your iPad. <laughs> just, just hand it to me. Okay. Now these things typically have somewhere in the neighborhood of 32 gigabytes of material or of storage in them or 64 gigabytes and in the future it's just going to get bigger and yes. bigger. But in a space that size, uh, I mentioned that I back up my office documents to a 32 or to a, a flash drive, it's a 32 gigabyte, big, th gigabyte flash drive. I've been practicing law for nearly 34 years. Every computer document I have ever generated fits into about half of that doc, of that uh, flash drive, 32 gigabytes. So everything I've ever written can fit into Barb's iPad there. Absolutely. And that includes documents that take up dozens and dozens of the banker's boxes yes. that we have stored. So the space saving is incredible. Absolutely. As we get rid of uh, the documents that we're permitted to, you're, you're freeing up the old metal filing cabinets, you know, in some courthouses uh, where ours are stored off site, we have hundreds and hundreds of old filing cabinets where these files are. So once they're, um, you know, scanned and, and put into the system, they'll be destroyed. And you just, you free up that, you free up all your banker's boxes. And it's, it's, it's an amazing, uh, it's an amazing way to, to do things. One of the things that we frequently don't recognize when we're doing business with somebody, whether it's a court or a, a corporation of some sort, is when a person walks in and says, I would like to see or I would like to find, there is an employee who has to stop whatever it was she or he was doing go and find those records, bring them to you, take you to a place where you can comfortably review them, and that costs lots of money over time. In the past, when people, uh, before we were in our new facility, when an individual would come in and want to look at one of those files, um, it got to a point where we would tell them, we need to have three or four days to go, because we would have to go off-site to a facility, in, like you say, into these dungeons and actually look for the files, poor lighting, poor conditions. Plus, you're taking an employee away from waiting, you know, doing their daily work or waiting on another customer. This way, when someone comes in, we can sit at our PCs, we can look up what they need, or we have a public access terminal where individuals can come in. And, and look up whatever they want on the, the, um, the public access terminal. We're talking about document imaging. My guests are Barbara Kaur, Clerk of the Circuit Court of Marion County, West Virginia, and Michael Manley, President and CEO of Software Systems Incorporated. I'm Dan Ringer, and this is The Law Works. Mike, uh, is it possible to remotely access some of these things? Yes, it is. That was another point I wanted to make. Um, not only is the access the old method of access, difficult, um, time consuming for people. Um, there was one copy of a file. So if someone needed to look at that file, they had to pick it up and carry it someplace else. If a judge needed it for a trial that was going on, for example, they would send someone to the circuit clerk's office, they'd retrieve that file and the judge would have it in the courtroom. Well, unless someone made copies of it for the other parties, there was only one copy and that's where it was. So if someone else needed it, you couldn't get it anymore. Uh, what Barb has going on in her courthouse is the judges actually have the capability at their bench to call up any documents for the case they're working on or a similar case or anything else they, they would like to retrieve from her records, see those on the spot and someone else can be viewing that document at the same time. So you don't have the issue of, um, of the papers only in one place and people have to stand in line to get to it. The other thing that um, that we're, we've been working on for a while and we're still uh, 
dealing with, uh, with concerns is outside access so that an attorney could get access to a copy of that file without coming to the courthouse. <coughs> Um, there are obviously concerns. Barb's office is, is very much different from the county clerk's office. The county clerk's office is all public records. Everything that they put in a book is out, out there for the public to look at. Anyone in the world can come and look at it. Uh, in Barb's office, uh, there are a lot of cases that no one can look at. There are a lot of situations where only attorneys who are part of the, the proceedings can look at those documents. and so also built into this process is a, as a set of security standards which limit the access to these records. That's not there with the paper documents. That was being done by a, I guess you call it a screening process that Barb's uh, office employees did where they said, oh, are you allowed to look at this document? Well, this is all automated now. And uh, our goal ultimately is to have any of the attorneys who who are doing business in their courthouse have remote access in and be able to retrieve those documents and view them in their office without without having to come and request the physical file. It sounds relatively <clears throat> simple when we talk about it the way Mike just did, but the cost savings to you when you employ an attorney to go in and research these records is amazing. Uh, I find that I can do work with regard to the land records that are kept in the county clerk's office, if the county clerk's office has imaged the documents and makes them available through the internet, I can sit at my desk and do in 10 minutes or 20 minutes what might very well take three or four hours to do if I have to go to the courthouse and then I have to wait until the other attorney who's using the book that I need finishes with it. Books are wonderful. You can turn pages back and forth. They're sometimes referred to as the perfect random access device. The problem is they're limited to one user at a time. Well, except <coughs> for the, the process where you can search for an index, it's also hard to find that document or that book. You have to know what you're looking for, and you have to physically go find that particular book, pull it out of the, go through that whole process. In Barb's case, she's got multiple indexes into each of her case files. She's got indexes by plaintiff, by defendant, by attorney, by judge. Um, so if, if an attorney comes in and is looking for something and doesn't happen to remember the case number when they, they come to the front counter and ask for the copy of that file, the folks in her office can look that up by the attorney's name, tell him who the parties are, and they can say, this is the one I want to look at. So there are some additional advantages to the computerization of these records other than just the storage of the, the documents themselves. Well. When Barb says she, we've invested or in Marion County, they've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars. And this is not just in Marion County. This is going on all over the state of West Virginia. The circuit clerks get together and they work with the Supreme Court to figure out how they want to handle what they need to handle. The county clerks get together. They work with the state auditor and the assessor to figure out how they handle what they need to handle. The sheriffs get together. and Everybody's working toward the same goals. And, and we ought to mention there are different ways of doing these things. Not everybody's using the same system. That's, that's correct. There are uh, different systems used in circuit clerk's offices throughout the state. Um, the Supreme Court is looking at what we, they're calling the unified judicial application. What they want to do, and this is where I think they really need to be given a lot of credit, is they don't want to come in and just like wipe out what we've done, you know, the, the hundreds of thousands of dollars we've spent. They are trying to find a way to, and there's 12 of us in the state of West Virginia on this particular application, to make everybody's system tie in together. So you could be sitting in your office and you could access a file in my office or in Morgan County. We're, we're just, they're trying to find a way to make it all tie in together. <laughs> and when you said Huge that, project. Mike smiled. Yes. <laughs> Mike's, Good luck. Because Mike's company is not the only one doing this sort of work. He's working with you. That's how right. we get together on this. But uh, we've got people speaking French, people speaking Austrian, people it, speaking it, Chinese, people speaking English right. in, in computer terms. And everybody's trying to talk to everybody else. One of my uh, favorite quotes from a friend of mine is, the best thing about standards is that there are so many of them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what, what the Supreme Court is trying to do at this point is establish some standards so that this information can be exchanged 
and um, they would like at, at some point, at least we've been led to believe, to have a, uh, a repository in Charleston which contains copies of all these records from all the counties so that you could do a statewide search, for example, for something in Charleston. It's a very ambitious project and um, it's obviously years down the road, but the first step in this is for people to get rid of the paper, get things in some sort of electronic form, because most of these electronic forms can be converted to other forms. Or we can create programs that allow each different type of computer system to read the forms from the other. Exactly. We get a common language. Uh, one such is uh, Adobe publishes a format called Portable Document Format, and it's been adopted as a kind of a de facto standard. Right. Mike Manley, Barbara Core, thank you very much for being with us. Things are improving, slowly maybe, but we're going to get we're there. We're getting there. Thank you. Thank you also for being with us. On behalf of the Law Works, I'm Dan Ringer. Good evening. On the Law Works website at thelawworks.org, you'll find a listing of recent The Law Works programs, additional information about this show's topic, and video of this and recent shows. You can also find The Law Works programs on YouTube and iTunes. If you would like to suggest a topic for a future The Law Works show, or if you're a school teacher and would like to receive a DVD of this show for classroom use, send us email at thelawworks at comcast.net or visit us on Facebook. The Law Works is produced in cooperation with the West Virginia Bar Foundation, the Mountain State Bar, the Monongalia County Bar Association, and the West Virginia University College of Law. The Law Works is made possible by a major grant from the West Virginia Bar Foundation, the philanthropic organization for West Virginia's legal profession and legal system, promoting public knowledge of the law in West Virginia. By the generous support of Software Systems Incorporated, a West Virginia company established in 1975, providing high-end support services, programming, and consulting for county government AS400 mid-range computer systems, as well as PC-based systems. And by viewers like you, from West Virginia Public Broadcasting.